Hello, everyone, and welcome out to The Good, The Bad, and The Geeky, a podcast where I sit down with some of my friends in the local Columbus, Ohio theater, film, and improv scene and talk a bunch of geeky stuff. Some of it good, some of it bad, but all of it definitely geeky. If you enjoy our program, be sure to subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts and to leave a review. Our official sponsor of the show is Audible with over 200,000 titles to choose from. You get a three days of membership free, with, which includes one audiobook and two Audible originals each month included with your trial. And then when you keep going after the trial, you still get one audiobook and two Audible originals each month. Like, that's amazing. You also get easy exchanges. So, hey, you know what? Say you got that new book. You're not loving it. You know what? So switch it out. Uh, get a new one. Swap it for free anytime. It's fourteen ninety five per month after the trial, and if you're interested, it's just this easy. You just need an Amazon account and go over to audibletrial.com forward slash good bad geeky. That's audibletrial.com forward slash good bad geeky and choose your first book free. Download the Audible app and start enjoying your new audio book. Did you know that we are proud members of the It's All Been Presents Network? Well, speaking of the network, Squatch Smashers. Some say it's a scripted rednecky hello from the Magic Tavern. Others say other things, but don't listen to them. If you like your hijinks wacky and your sass extra sassy, then listen in as the simple podcast within a podcast about a paranormal investigator working out at a t-shirt kiosk in a rundown mall evolves into the tale of a Bigfoot hunter, a vampire, a killbot, and Elvis, the record room master, you know what I'm saying, pretty mama? On the run from a nefarious government. Hey, ho ha! Government forces and random cryptids in the enormous underground series of catacombs. The excellent, somebody probably at the New York Times, if they heard of the show, second season of Squatch Masters continues. Please support the show and others by going to ibdpresents.com. All right, guys, on this episode, I am really looking forward to it. And that is because we have our good friend Eric Sternberger. Um, you can check out his writing at ericsternberger.com. And then you can also check out a project that's very near and dear to his heart and to his wife's heart as well. It's Rescued Ohio, R-E-S-C-U-E-D, Ohio.org. And uh, find out how you can help out Rescued Ohio and help out all the dogs um, that need your love and support. So uh, in this episode, the reason why we're kind of talking about Rescue to Ohio, though, not the main reason why, but it's one of the reasons why Eric was like, hey, let's just throw it out there, is because we're talking about The Secret Life of Pets 2. Did Eric and I enjoy the movie? Do we feel that there's some flaws with it? Is it funny? Well, find out right after our song. Roll it, Will. My dog's barking. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, this is a very special there episode goes. because, as as you can hear, we're going to be talking about the secret life of the pets. <laughs> two, Electric Boogaloo. No, it's just called Two. And it's a film that, I mean, it features an all-star cast. It has Patton Oswalt, Eric Stone Street, Kevin Hart, Jenny Slate, Tiffany Haddish, Lake Bill, Nick Kroll, Dana Carvey, Ellie Kemper... Is the Anthony Mackie in it? No, uh, Morgan is a Hannibal Buress. Yes, it, Hannibal Buress. Okay, Bobby Monahan, uh, Harrison Ford is the big the big new add to the cast, um, and yeah, and some other voices too. So, now did you notice the one? Uh, there's one actually that did strike me. Of course, uh, I didn't catch that the one was Pete Holmes until I looked it up afterwards. Oh yeah, I didn't either. I, um, I had no clue. I did. I didn't catch. That Sergey was Nick Kroll until I saw the credits and I saw Nick Kroll come up. I go, well, I bet he was Sergey. Well, isn't that weird too? When you're like, because I was listening to his voice, the Sergey when he was talking in the movie, I was like, who is that guy? I know this voice. Yeah. And then I was like, oh yeah, of course it's Nick Kroll, of course. And then um, you see the one that uh, really interested me that I saw was uh, Meredith Salinger. Yes, as the cat lady, uh, Patton Oswalt's wife. Yeah, which that's uh, that's so weird, and it's not weird. It's just that 
Okay, so I don't really know who she is, and I know like people are like, "Oh, she's a big nerd," and I'm like, yeah. I have not heard of her until Pat Oswald said he was dating her. I thought she was the girl who played. Oh, I feel really bad now. The green. Oh my god, I'm the na- the alien species is escaping me on Star Wars Rebels. She was. Oh, the okay, Hera. The, yeah, Hera. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, I was also trying to think of what what species he was, and my mind just went, "Nope, you're on your own." <laughs> and I was like, "No, no bueno." Oh, uh, well, before we uh, go too far on that about uh, voices, yeah. though, the one that really when I was like just you know looking at the voices afterwards on IMDb, one that I was like, "Wait, what?" Was Lorraine Newman? Lorraine Newman. Which one's Lorraine Sh- Newman? Additional voices. Okay, Wait. and I'm like, I'm like, how do you have an original SNL cast member as additional voices? That or may, maybe that's a that maybe that's a thing that she wanted done. I don't know. Some pe- people are weird sometimes because I, I don't know. It, well, I mean, you probably are a little bit more read up on that that than those people than I am. Like, I, in terms of like the characters we don't hear, uh, the actors and the characters we don't hear enough about anymore. Yeah. Like, you know, is it Jane Polly? I'm not saying that right. Jane Polly. Jane Polly is a, is a news reporter who was, uh, <laughs> yeah, was... who was on third rock from the sun. And she's a, oh, uh, Jane Curtin, Jane Curtin. Yeah. Oh my God. This is, if this was a live episode, I'd be so fucked up and drunk right now. Uh, Jane Curtin, like she still acts and still does things. Like you don't really hear a lot. Uh, at least from my pers- my perspective, and I feel like I see a lot of movies and TV shows. I, or at least I read about them. Not heard anything from her, so maybe yeah. that's it's like a Rick Moranis thing where she's just like, "I'll do it. This is awesome, but uh, I want like additional there, voice credit." There's an interesting thing too, where a lot of the kind of '90s SNL women have been showing up as moms and things now. Which I I like a lot. Well, uh, who was um, uh, Clay Corn? I thought she yeah. was really good back in the day. Um, now the other girl, she's kind of taken a. Uh, she was really good friends with Weird Al. She was in UHF. She was in like the Mike Myers and uh, Blonde. Always came yeah, off kind she, of. She got really right wing weird. Yeah, I, that's what I was about ready to say. Like, yeah, that's the only thing with her is that I thought she was great back then, and then I realized, oh, she has horrible opinions on on things, and she should. Yeah. Yeah. So that is sad, but yeah. Who who else have you seen lately that's oh, been coming back? There's, there's been a few. What was shoot? One of them was in uh, Detroiters. I, I'm blanking on who played like Tim Robinson's mom in that. But yeah, there's been, like so many of them from like that that '90s SNL have just kind of been like like Julia Sweeney uh, has kind of popped up in a couple things recently. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. So well. When I just did a search on it real quick, the first thing that came up was Jason Sudeikis, but that's not – obviously, he is not a she. No. Uh, I'm trying to think of – see who else. Uh, uh, Nora Dunn. Nora – oh, my God. Nora Dunn. Yeah, she played uh, Tim Rock. But it's funny. Like you're seeing, I think, a lot of the uh, comedians that grew up, I think, liking SNL are kind of grabbing some of these uh, great performers that just didn't – you know, I think back then they kind of got – overshadowed and screwed out of a lot of roles was done the one that actually dated lauren michaels and then they had a big falling out wasn't um, that a thing or i know there was one actor actress who dated uh, him and he i thought he kind of fired her i am not sure on that uh, it was i don't know why i'm thinking of that oh yeah because it was she boycotted sinead o'connor I, okay wait a minute hold on i think this is it uh, she, okay. With, uh, yeah, I think she did. Bo- yeah, she was one of the ones I think who boycotted uh, Andrew Dice Clay. Okay, yeah, Andrew Dice Clay and Sinead O'Connor. No, 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 musical guest with Sinead O'Connor. Andrew Dice Clay was the comedian of the episode. I mean, damn, that was like a one-two punch, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and, Sh- and Sinead ended up getting the headlines. Right, which yeah, because isn't that was the thing too about that episode? Andrew Dice Clay was actually that he showed a soft side, like he showed he could act. Yeah, or, you know, and he just wasn't that character for the whole thing. And yeah. I think years later, he said someone warned him never do that, and then he did it because he's like, "Oh, I'm big enough now. I don't, I won't, I don't have to worry about that." And then he did it, and then his career just kind of took a nosedive after. Grant, he also did Ford Farlane. Yeah, and yeah. but you know what? It's the same point that I think it was because of that soft side is why he's actually having a bit of a resurgence the last five six years. Yeah, what what movie was he in recently where he was he actually he acted in? Like it wasn't the movie with Joseph Gordon-Levitt, was it? Where he was the he, the guy who was obsessed with porn. 
Uh, Don Juan. Don Juan. No, no, that was Tony Danza. What yeah, movie was... am I thinking of? Like he played like the dad, and was a very loving and yeah, uh, yeah. I can't remember, but yeah, he's he's kind of had like a bit of a, I don't know, showing some different chops lately, which is always what, good. Which is nice. Oh, he appeared as Lorenzo in A Star Is Born, playing Gaga's father. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. I that's, to there, there we go. Okay. <laughs> it's it's so sad though that out oh, that whole movie we remember any other side character but we don't remember Andrew Dice Clay. <laughs> well, I still haven't seen that one. I I I I need to rewatch it. I I feel like I went in kind of with horse blinders on, just wanting just, to not like it, and I, I do that, and I don't know why. I need to. I'm a I, jerk. I don't know. That's one where I just feel like I don't know if I feel like I need. I just I've not, I haven't felt a need to see it. I'm not anti it in any way, but I'm like it's fourth time the story has been done. <laughs> it, it's just like when you see the sixth reboot of Spider Man, you're just like, do I need to see this? Uh, that's it, kind of like I'm like, I, yeah, I really hope they don't show Martha Wayne's pearls dropping in the in the Batman. Oh God, yes. <laughs> so so here's what's really funny is uh, my wife, God lover. She she knows that Batman's parents died, but she doesn't really know the how or why or what what imagery is tied to it. So when we watch Batman vs Superman, she hated it so much because she, there was nothing really clearly explained to her about what Batman's origins was. Okay, not really. Like they just showed a flashback of him having those dreams, but she didn't understand the imagery, so it was completely lost on her. God love her, and so that's why I'm just like you should really probably watch. The 89 Batman or Batman Begins. And let's be honest, Batman Begins is probably the better bet for you. And she's like, I don't know, it looks super dark. And I was like, okay. Well, one day it'll be waiting for you and you will enjoy yeah. it, I feel. I feel like your dog is saying, hey, talk yeah. about us. And, and, he is. and he's not wrong. He's so not we're, wrong. We're, we're really here not to talk about SNL. We're, no. we're, we're Andrew Dice Clay. Or, or a, ra- a rabbit hole of uh, actresses and actors who need to get their due. Exactly. Even though that would be nice. We're actually here to talk about The Secret Life of Pets 2. I'll throw this out there. I'm, Illumination is the, the company that produced uh, the film. Yes. And, and of all the stream of films they've done, I would say it's, it's, it's a step below DreamWorks. And what I mean by that is that it's, candy, it's, it's delicious candy coating. It's just candy. It's sweet, yeah. and it, but it rots your teeth if you really think about it too hard, or if you if you watch too much or eat too much of it. Well, and I will um, say, so up until maybe How to Train Your Dragon, I would have put them above it, but just because I feel like so much of DreamWorks, at some point DreamWorks stopped getting into the making everything very rushed. Yes, which is nice. For a long time, I felt like a lot of their stuff was was was, was very primitive shape and rushed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's very granted, Yeah, and now, now granted, I feel like Illumination, it, when, when they're not dealing with Despicable Me, they really fall into that a lot. I think they get away with Despicable Me, and that's because it's so stylized. Yeah. That that you don't kind of notice that. But like, it's like I like all the... Um, with the, like the Madagascar kind of stuff, but like let's be honest, a lot of those characters are very easily created. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess from a standpoint is that DreamWorks, like, I don't mind a good pop, pop culture reference, but like yeah, ever yeah, since yeah. I feel like Shrek Two, oh, it's God, it's yeah. it's it's almost like I, I I sometimes call this when I see it nowadays. I see it like I call it the Family Guy effect, which is mm-hmm. oh that thing that worked really well in our first movie that made like gazillion dollars. Let's just take the stuff that people really love about it. Now granted Shrek two is still a good movie, but that's was the beginning of where it was a lot of pop culture. Like there was a oh, Justin yeah. Timberlake joke for God's sakes, which well, is that the one that has an entire section that is essentially American idol. Uh, With Simon Cowell. I think that's the third one. Okay. Uh, but, where Timberlake then actually shows up in the episode in, in the movie. Oh, yeah. he, I think he plays King Arthur, okay. which, yeah, but, but still like that. I just remember like, why are there a bunch of pop culture references? Like the whole Michael Eisner joke in the first movie as Lord Farquaad. Like I didn't even get that till probably about five years ago. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's how very yeah. subtle it is. Like it's literally, he's a short dude and he thinks he's better than everybody else. And so he overcompensates and that's the joke. But then you're like, oh, it's extra funny because of Eisner and whatever. Right. But you don't need that to make that funny. Like, I feel like, 
they started doing everything very like just let's hammer home these pop culture jokes. Yeah. And I feel like Illuminate. I remember the first Despicable Me movie came out. I love the, the visuals, but I was yeah. very disappointed. I actually didn't care for the movie. I oh, thought really? that. Well, I thought that Gru's journey to being a dad was just. It felt like Beauty and the Beast, where it's like, oh, we got ten minutes to go. I guess he has to save the girls now. It, it felt like I know it's a movie, but like at least with DreamWorks, even DreamWorks, I feel like it feels like a little bit more effort goes into some of that, and so I, was, I got really turned off by it. And so I, I, I feel which which Shrek, one of the Shreks, completely pissed me off. It might have been the third one, where basically the entire message is it's okay to look however you are, and then Fiona changed herself to look like an ogre. I think I think it's I think it's kind of no, it's not two. I think it's three. Yeah, at that point, I was like, "Fuck Shrek." Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, so so because the second one was where Shrek becomes a good-looking human, and yeah. the fairy godmother turns her back into a human temporarily, something like that. And uh, so Shrek is Shrek and Donkey are the ones that look a lot better. Yeah. And then by the end of it, uh, when they have true love's kiss again, they turn into who they really are, which. You know, it's really talking about being true to yourself again, but this time from Fiona's perspective too, which was kind of cool. And they right. had a great musical but number. Then it anyway, it completely betrays that in the third one, which oh, kind of, totally, which, which kind of then brings me back here to Secret Life of Pets in a roundabout okay. way. Yeah, the entire concept of the first one essentially was this is what the pets do when the owners aren't home. Yeah, we lost a lot of that in the, this one. Oh my god, they go on a fucking road trip together for. Like, I don't know, one of our three stories, which we'll get to that later. With Max and Duke, yeah. Uh, it, it, it serves no purpose. Not really. It doesn't really serve yeah. any purpose to any – actually, none of, of anything serves any purpose to anything except for Tiffany Haddish's character showing up out of nowhere and being like, I need yeah. the rabbit, to, <laughs> which – here's the thing. Quick, someone give us a plot. <laughs> yes. The movie is – I will say this, though. The movie is genuinely funny. And well, I will not knock it, but like it, it literally should be called Secret Life of Pets Two in Search of Plot because Yeah, it's it's there's good scenes. Oh yeah. It 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 honestly feels like and I think A V Club said this, that it, it feels like they took three direct to D V D shorts and turned it into a a movie. Yes. And it's it, it's like it's like we have like let's have and also, like with that, there's like five. How long was that opening over, like narration that took us up to the kid being like two years old? Oh my god! Yeah, it was. I felt like it was like ten minutes long. It was probably five, but still, it's too long. Yeah, it's it's, like, it's good. I don't like kids. And blah 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 blah. And then suddenly he's like really nervous about this kid. Like, well, the thing about him not liking kids never comes back. Why did we open the movie with that? Right, like it feels very disconjointed from even within its the confines of its own story, it's very super out of place. Like, yeah, yeah the entire like maybe first three minutes aren't needed. We could have jump cut right to the bit to them, you know, him saying, "But how? I've got a great life." Cut to Pete Holmes getting hit by a car or whatever that was, or running his bike into a car and a baby being born. I mean, you could you could have jump cut straight to that and lost everything before that. Right, and here's the thing too. Like, if you would have told me going into the movie, it's really about him protecting this kid that he doesn't like, and of course he'll fall in love with the kid by the end. It's been done many times. Ice Age is a good example well, of that. He but falls, he falls in love with the kid in the first fifteen minutes. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, if they would have gone with that plot, yeah, even though it's been done so many times before, I would have been way more. Because then I felt like, oh, it's doing something or it's trying to go towards something. But, like, yeah, it, within that narration, he falls in love with the kid and then it's <laughs> – He goes through an entire – he goes through a movie's entire character arc in, in, in narration. That's – yeah. And, and, and then we get to the movie. I'm like, you've just done an entire character arc. So this is one of the things I was trying to say before, and I got muddled in the in the details, which was about the DreamWorks, how Illumination for me feels like it, that. I felt that way about all Illumination movies for the most part, where they're they're just like they barely scratch the surface. They're they're enjoyable, they're funny, they're entertaining. Like I did enjoy the humor in Despicable Me, but I didn't love it for like, how everybody else did. But Secret Life of Pets, I felt was the first time they actually kind of had like that kind of what they were doing worked really well 
and it 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 yeah. holds up to the other like Pixar and DreamWorks movies. I mean, it's not like How to Train Your Dragon or Toy Story three level of yeah. drama, but like it's a good movie. Like I will still pull it up and watch it religiously because it's a it's a it's a damn entertaining movie. Well, and, and I then, really like this first. I really like the first one, and I'm, I'm kind of surprised that it is it is the same writer. Yeah, I know, right? Isn't that that's so depressing? And he's generally a a pretty good writer. Yeah, uh, let me see what what other stuff I mean, he, he did. Minions, he did. I mean, he's, he's basically been in the Illumination and DreamWorks animation kind of setup. Oh yeah, but, Brian Lynch. Yeah, yeah. But he's but he, I think he's written a couple like children's books and stuff. He's I follow him on Twitter. And he's, he's he's really entertaining and has good stuff to say about the story. But this one just. I mean, I felt like it was all a, a device to get to the next scene, and none of the characters had arcs uh, or like even character. Yeah, they really didn't. Like, I mean, I, I wanted to say it for a second, and then I stopped myself because then I realized it's not necessarily true. But it feels like Pops had more of a character arc than Max did, and he was yeah. on the screen less time. Because, like, he's a grumpy character that clearly doesn't seem to really enjoy those kids. Mm-hmm. But he does. Like, you know what I mean? Like, by, so, but yeah. the last time you see him in the movie, you're, again, he's in the movie for, like, five minutes. Which, well, I, it's just, it's so frustrating. Well, well it's like uh, Gigi's story, who, I, I love the character Gigi. God, yes. Je- Jenny Slate is so fucking good. It's just one of those things where I, I mean if she wasn't so good giving the voice to that character, it's like, I don't know if I'd care about that character, but like they have interesting scenes with that character, but there's no, I mean, there's no story arc and there's no like stakes. They're really, like, yeah, cause the stake for her would be if she gets Mr. B back or whatever the hell the thing's called, happy B. If she gets happy B back, uh, uh, Max will love her B, in her mind. I thought, I thought maybe it was busy B. It was busy right. B, busy yeah. B, sorry. I mean, nothing that matters. Uh, excuse me, uh, Eric and Nick. Uh, Busy B is a very vital important. It's the plot of the movie. Um, <laughs> God, damn it! <laughs> uh, well, I mean, uh, he is the only character that kind of braces a few things, but like, there's no. At, at no point does Max say, "Don't lose him. He's very important to me." It's just like you know, I want you to watch him. Right. There, there's no like, what would happen if you don't? It's all imagined stakes by Gigi, by Gigi, Gigi. And there's no returning of Busy B to him at the end. Right. And it just feels so disconnected. Like if like it, so there is no crossover where like, so normally if we were had human characters, they would probably call each other. It's like, Hey, just checking in. How's my Busy B doing? And yeah. I know that's harder to do, but that's the, it's called the fucking secret life of pets. They were right. fucking using iPods and shit in the last one, jamming the music and walkie talkies. Yeah. They, they could have they could have sat phones. It's what I'm talking about. Or also, they could just use FaceTime, something. I mean, can, can you imagine a funny thing of like him getting the iPad face or like FaceTiming or something, or, or and trying like I want to can I can I hear Busy B and Keith just like uh yeah hang on like making the sound of the noise her oh, voice it's like, yeah what, what's wrong with Busy B oh nothing he sounds sick is he okay <laughs> it was just like something to kind of. Because like once they kind of go on their own separate ways, we have three completely separate stories that don't come back together until the end. And even then, it's very. Well, I feel it's, it, it's like I, I was talking about like uh, an improv that's called a herald, right? Where you have essentially three separate stories that come together at the end, and maybe start based on a suggestion that loosely tie together. Mm-hmm. But generally, there's some interweaving in between the two, like slight crossovers among the way. And like, there was none of that. I feel like the busy bee was like an excuse to get Gigi to the cat lady to become queen of the cats so that they could adopt the tiger to save the bunny storyline. Yeah. Which, mm. I mean, it it, it didn't feel like there was like an arc to her. or there, There was, there was, uh, a story of overcoming obstacles other than the one scene. Right. And what's also sad if, if you like, I follow the trailers for, for movies and like, especially the secret life of pets ones, 
they're it's a funny movie like you know what i mean it's more of a comedy so yeah. when they release a new character trailer literally every character trailer gives away just the entire plot of the movie yeah. which because they're it's so thin that it's it feels very dis. I guess they'd also add to the disappointment, like and, and it kind of sets it up too. The fact that when they did the character trailers, like the fact that none of them were linked together, it was like, oh, this doesn't bode well, right? Like you, I feel like this was all something meant for like the just character trailers, and they just uh, yeah. for the most part. Like I will say, the whole thing of her going in and retrieving Busy Bee and being hailed Queen of the Cats after the defeat of the red dot is oh. hysterical oh, and that is funny. and it's very funny but also it's very dramatic within uh, context of the of what's going on it's a great scene yeah and i feel like it would fit in really well in a context of a more a, with better plot but it, yeah. it just feels like no it's just on its own it doesn't really yeah it's so it's so it's so heartbreaking but i mean it really is it's kind of like a little it's that's it's like the short film where it's like Here's the obstacle. Here's how we're going to overcome it. We overcame it. Yeah, and it, there is no narr- larger narrative where it's trying where the, well, the stakes that need to be overcome, where all the characters get together really and and save the day. And it, it's matter of fact, I feel like it, the characters got forced together. Like I feel like the cats would have seen those dogs with those hats on. Yeah. It, it made it funny, though. I, you know what I mean? But I felt like it was just a way to put those characters in there because, oh, they were major characters in the first film. Let's make sure they still stay in there. Yeah. You know, it's stuff like that. I was just like, you know, you have these great actors that, that could, can do these parts. Just freaking write something for them or just have it make more yeah. sense congelled. It, but, but again, like you said, it was funny in the fact that even like the scenes with Pops and Pickles. Oh, geez, yeah. God, Pickles killed me. Pickles uh, was t- Tara Strong, right? Or no, Sweet Pea. Sweet Pea. P- who was Pickles? Pickles was the one dog who like wanted to poop in the shoe. Oh. And then later yeah. it was like, you disappointed Pickles. <laughs> that's, that's, okay. Yeah, that was, that was. Which, which was, I mean, that was a great little side character jokes. Right. Now, and can I also say, too, I'm glad that they didn't do the thing that they usually do in movies like this where the older mentor character dies, like Rooster. I was like, and it's yeah. Harrison Ford. He's been doing this a lot lately. So when he gives him the handkerchief, I was like, oh, God, is he going to go off and die because he's a dog? And that's sometimes what dogs do. They, they're, that's the trope. They go off and to be alone. And, and luckily, that's not what happened. But Okay, and here, here's the thing. When, obviously, the story with Max and Rooster is uh, that Max R- Rooster thinks Max is a scared of cat, he's scared of everything, and he needs to uh, be a dog, essentially. Right. Be, uh, be a stereotypical dog. So when, Ma- when Rooster saves Max from a fox, and yeah. then later on when uh, Cotton, the baby sheep, walks, you know, goes off into the woods. And yeah, again, what- Cotton's character was hilarious. And by the way, played by uh, Sean uh, Guillembrone uh, from the uh, Goldbergs. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, but yeah, once he got saved, but he he's gone off into the woods. Yeah, right. All I could think of was, oh, now Max is going to get a chance with the fox. Oh yeah, the yeah. fox. Like, and it's like, nope, it's eating apples on the sledge. It's like, well, then why did we have a whole thing with the fox earlier? It feels very. I mean, I guess it's realistic that weird shit can happen on the farm, but 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 when but, we're dealing with such like short film narratives and like we oh the, yeah one of these things was and like needing an arc, it's like that fox would have gave him an arc of overcoming a thing he previously couldn't overcome. Totally. There was nothing about him having like a fear of heights earlier on. Yeah, that that's just uh, that's just yeah. There was nothing about that, and uh, yeah, because I thought for a second, I was like, oh, he, I thought that too. It's like, he's going to go fight the fox, and then when he didn't, my first thought is, oh, that's kind of refreshing, but then it's just like, yeah, but by the end of the movie, there's no plot to anything, so we could have used the goddamn fox. Right. Where, yeah, and and I will say too, the design of how they did the fox in that scene was very good. Oh, that was cool. Uh, right, and it, I, oh, Yeah. Yeah, I feel like there's just like kind of a lot of missed opportunities like that. And I don't know, I mean, I don't know where those missed opportunities come from. I don't know if they thought that, well, we don't need the fox because he's going to eventually 
stand up to the wolves later, if that's supposed to be the the analogous scene. But I felt, I don't know, it didn't feel quite even. It's, like, it's one of those things that like, if that were the case, if that's what you're trying to do, give us a little bit of a flashback of the fox in his mind or something. Yeah. Which, I mean, it's been long enough, and especially because if you're dealing with kids, mm-hmm. you know, you show them that, that this is what he's doing. He's like realizing he can be a dog and stand up to these other animals. Oh yeah. And, and sadly that's something where he, he, I mean, he kind of does at the end, but um, yeah, it's, it's very, it's, it's, the film was very underwhelming at the end of the day and, and not even a way I was expecting it to be like, yeah, it, it, it's, it reminds me of like, okay, like the first one I said is, is a good movie. Yeah, I, I like the first one. I'll you know I'll watch. It. I'll sit down and start the first one up. You know, the, you know Ashley was excited for this one because she liked the first one. Yeah, um, that's, that's how my wife was too. Yeah, and she had the same reaction to this one. She was like, "Well, it wasn't as good, but it was." I laughed. But like this reminds me of the kind of movie that, like, if you have kids, mm-hmm. this is the one that they like decide they want to watch, and you try to talk them out of it. <laughs> It's like I, can, I can just see like one of my friends being like, "I want to watch Secret Life of Pets too." Oh, you mean Zootopia? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Zootopia or anything, but anything that's not Frozen and yeah. Secret yeah. Life of Pets too. Yeah, no, you're you're 100 percent right. Uh, the Grinch is now available on Netflix here in the U.S. Oh, right. And I watched that movie, and that one now see that that's a bit of a different hill to talk about because the film is very much a um, it's a different beast. Because sure. you're dealing with the book, you're dealing with the expectations of the Jim Carrey movie, and the classic, which is the Chuck Jones special. You have so yeah. many things that you're vying for, and you're still trying to do something that's unique, that still feels like Dr. Seuss. And, but like, I, I, I feel like that, to me, even though I was disappointed in that movie, ultimately, it was still enjoyable. I would rather watch that again than watch Life of Pets 2. Yeah. Like, like it, and again, it's a funny movie, but like, it doesn't spring to me and saying, oh, I am a good movie. It's a, I'm a funny movie. I guess. Watch me. Sure. Yippee. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> it's, it's how very underwhelmed and how I, how I feel about that whole movie. And it was such a bummer because I was looking forward to it so much. Yeah, it was too. It's kind of one of those things where the. I mean, it might be like the most damning thing to say about it, but it's inoffensive. Right. And because, I mean, the first one wasn't offensive, you know what I mean? And that's why we liked it. It was, it just had something more, well, a plot, but it, it had, it had a, a million things more going for it than this one does. And here's the thing. They're well, going to make they, a third one. Yeah. Well, I don't know. This one underperformed. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, when, when I say inoffensive, I mean, like it wasn't bad there was nothing about it that was like i got you uh, yeah. but it was like uh it, it's, it's kind of like one of those things so like if i do a comedy show the worst thing i could hear for someone just be like you're like meh i'd rather yeah. i piss off an entire audience than uh and and i'm and i think i have before um <laughs> <laughs> then uh then you know it, it, at least you feel something oh yeah yeah i, I, I mean we're this far into it and we haven't even mentioned the third plot <laughs> oh yeah because well it's just it's just so so the third plot is and it is actually pretty funny but it really just feels like it's tiffany haddish asking kevin hart to put her in the movie yeah and again i've not seen night school i've actually heard it is a good it's a funny movie and and every time i see them do interviews together they are hysterical bouncing off of each other but, but again um, it's, it's just tiffany haddish and kevin hart being themselves being doing a thing together right and and now again i like the idea that snowball is still very self-conceited and mm-hmm. which is a which is a story point from the first movie a little bit uh where it's part of his character and they they de- they throw that in spades here and again he had to me one of my favorite moments in the movie which is during the mid credit scenes he creates a rap troupe yeah. and he just starts rapping about panda <laughs> which <laughs> that I was think really I, funny it was, and I think I missed a line that Molly, his owner, said something about the panda. Like, I, did they? Did he? Did she say like he's an extreme rapper or something? And then he's just like, "No, fuck that! I'm the rapper." And he starts doing panda. Know. 
it felt like I missed a line that made that made more sense. But the thing is, is that even if it if they didn't have that in there, it was still hysterical. Oh, like my. it was so funny. It was just literally me. Literally the first like four seconds of it was like. Do they mention something about the panda besides just the fact that the panda's in the room, that he's a rapper or something? Did I miss that little whatever? But either way, this is fucking gold. Oh, yeah. And But also the tiger. The tiger thing, like, I, as much as the first film gets thing, like, look, you know for a fact they ain't actually, like, you know, playing the stereo and shit like that. Or not the way that they're showing it in the movie because it's animation, whatever. Uh-huh. I, I get that. But it's way more believable than them kidnapping and protecting a fucking tiger. Yeah. Over I, a weekend. Over a weekend. Yes. Yes. And, and, and if pops, he was there for like what, not even a full day. Yeah. Um, that fucking house, Dukes and Max's house would have been fucking torn off. Tiger would have pissed everywhere. Mark and territory. Like, well, and I think that's kind of my problem with this one in general is that, I feel like so many of the good characters from the first one kind of got sidelined that we actually cared about their secret life. Yeah. And that we add in Rooster, the dog, who doesn't have a secret life. He's doing his he, – he has a job. That's actually a fascinating thing you just kind of mentioned, like in the fact that he doesn't have a secret life. He is straight up who he is. Yeah. He never changes – and 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 here's the thing i usually hate i sometimes love it but i usually end up hating it where they say the name of the movie in the movie or the uh-huh. tv show um sometimes if you can make it funny then i'm or make it feel normal then it's fine but so you're like, the, you like the anti Stephen woosley yeah kind of so our good friend Woos, who i love very dearly um like for example in scrubs it feels very natural to me in the pilot and he goes when i look at you i i don't see another human being with thoughts and feelings i see just another pair of scrubs walking around and i was just like that's cool but even though there's something the light goes off and goes oh he said the name of the show I, it, it felt very natural for me but when other other times it shows up i get a little bit ooh uh, every um, time you said friends and friends or seinfeld and seinfeld oh my god oh wasn't that the worst i mean those words they just need to block them out of the vocabulary jerry seinfeld oh fuck again it's like uh uh have you seen my friend what's what's your friend's name jerry seinfeld oh god seinfeld um well, i guess we know what show we're watching <laughs> well, good thing it wasn't the Seinfeld Chronicles because right. then it's just like, oh, hey, God. Jerry. Oh, yeah. Then they try to work that shit in. It's just like, have you oh, seen my God. friend Jerry? What's his last name? Seinfeld. He has some Chronicles, doesn't he? You know, the Seinfeld Chronicles. Oh, my God. Yeah. That every, made zero every, sense, but it was. Every, every episode ends with him writing in a journal, Sex on the City style. <laughs> <laughs> Today. Kramer ate all my cereal. I was. I very learned a lot sad. today. I learned a lot today. I learned that jaywalking is still a, a major crime in Rhode Island. Um, <laughs> it becomes a running gag in the day every episode. What did I do today? What did I learn today? Nothing. And it cuts out. <laughs> George is very concerned. George's concern about shrinkage was was truly dumbfounded and or well founded shrinkage period the end of the episode and then you carry on yeah the the bunny stuff though it, it was snowball funny as hell but it just again where felt like they're just throwing where the, where the hell did tiffany haddish know about the snowball from yes like what like like again i know this is a kid's film but like put some fucking effort into it man you know like, maybe maybe he's printing off flyers and throwing them out his window and then, yeah. we see, and then we see Tiffany Haddish to get hit in the face with a flyer. That makes way more sense. And here's the thing, too. It's look for to humans. It looks like gibberish because it looks like probably paw prints or something. But to another <laughs> animal, yeah. but to another animal, it clearly says, if you need help, go to uh, the super snowball, whatever the hell he calls yeah, himself. Yeah. Captain Snowball. But yeah, it's like, it's like it, it's, it felt like it was missing a lot of like those type of, you know, like character things or... I don't know. Like, like, or actually, for God's sakes, make it make a point to say, like, hey, like, you know, maybe Tiffany Hatch's character is the same for Snowball as Rooster is for Max, because she's pretty straightforward too. She don't fucking mess around. Right. 
I don't feel like she has a secret life, so to speak. Well, no, that's not true. Her secret life is she fucking hides a cat for some goddamn true. reason. Um, well, and that's kind of the thing, too. Is like, all right, so the narration at the beginning, as we go into how much yes. there is, yes. and then the narration over at the end don't really thematically match up. Oh. Because his narration at the end is about how things change. Mm-hmm. But I don't feel like any character but him was struggling with change. Right. It, it, it's... If mm-hmm. if something was like let's let's imagine we're doing so if, if that's what we want to do this let's imagine something's happening to the building at the same time and everyone's having to deal with the change that's happening in the building yeah so, like that would be uh, that would be way more it would make, make way more sense you know I yeah I'm I'm with you 100 percent okay so not to go back to Scrubs for some reason but it's popping in there like. I didn't notice this until I heard Bill Lawrence say this, but he's like, sometimes we would write the intros or the narration because he narrates throughout the whole episode. Uh And sometimes, though, the narration at the end didn't really justify the narration from the beginning. And the only thing is, is that no one for the most part seems to really care. So we just keep doing it. But (laughs) it's just like. Like, for example, I think one of them is like, but in the end, the most important thing to accept is that no matter how alone you feel, how painful it may be, with the help of uh, other people around you, you'll get through this too. But the whole episode is about, you know, getting a Sunday or something. And you're like, what the fuck is at the cafeteria and the janitor keeps fucking around? Like, what the fuck did that have to do with the plot A, B, and C? It, it Yeah, I, I, that's how all of this movie feels is like that. <laughs> Yeah, and that's again, that's where so like where plot A, B, and C never kind of come together. That's like one of those things where a, a lot of times, like say Seinfeld as an example, they might have an A, B, and a C plot going on. Mm-hmm. You know, George's, Elaine's, and, and, and Jerry's, but then at certain points, they might all meet up in Jerry's apartment and then break again, or they meet up in the diner and they break again. They have like reset points, yeah, where like they kind of cross over and affect each other's stories. Right, because they one of them might actually run into like the other person they're talking about, or they ask for advice about what to do in that situation, and then and then right. they run into each other, and then one person tries to, like Elaine tries to help George and Jerry, but ends up making things worse, or then and then there's Kramer, who's just right. he can he can well, fit like, into any situation. Uh, an, um, issue, an issue Elaine's dealing with gives Jerry an idea in Act Two. Yeah, which then saw either solves it and makes a problem worse, or make or just you know makes a problem so much worse. Well, and, usually I feel like it does. T- it solves it temporarily, but not really. It actually right. makes it worse. But no, but yeah, you're 100 percent right. 100 percent right. And, and this doesn't have any of those kind of touch points where the stories and the characters actually get to affect each other. Yeah, and it's it's, it's such a bummer because you wanted more. You want more from the. From the movie, uh, and, and you want more, and it's like it. The scenes are good. Oh yeah, and, and the performances are good. I, and it, it's a hundred. It's it's an hour and twenty six minutes, and it's like I almost feel like if they just took another ten minutes and kind of weaved the things together just a little bit more, it might even move better. Because I felt like, oh, well, now we're at the farm for ten minutes. Now we're at the circus for eight minutes. Now we're, you know, oh, what I mean, it was like, yeah. Well, it's it's as you said. The one article you 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 referenced, it literally feels like three separate shorts, probably made for a DVD special or oh, something yeah. for the first movie, then just got split up and put together for the second one. I, I mean, and I feel like that is actually accurate. Like it mm-hmm. feels like a tack on. It feels like a, a a special on the DVD or like a TV special they would throw out. Yeah, yeah. Like when <laughs> like when Disney tried to do the Olaf thing and decided to put it in front of uh, whatever movie that was. Oh, oh yeah, uh, Coco, yeah. Pixar's Pixar's Coco, yeah, Pixar. yeah. Jesus, and I, I think I, I think we talked about this on on another GBG episode. I don't know which one it was, but it, uh, that movie is Stockholm Syndrome reborn because <laughs> I, I, my first instinct was, oh fuck, I knew this was going to happen, but oh god, I think I hate this more than I hate life itself. And then midway through, I was like. There's some funny stuff in here. And yeah. then by the end of it, I was like, well, that wasn't horrible. I don't well, ever want to yeah. see it again. But yeah. it wasn't it wasn't bad. If, but my total attitude about it kind of changed by the end of it, which is like I hate his death incarnate. And I was like, meh, you know, p- hit me, sir. Please, can I have another? Yeah. yeah. Like, again, it's like one of those things where it's not bad. It's just not welcome. 
<laughs> yes, yes. But I don't think I will say everyone in the theater did not appreciate it because you're taking I think Coco is like a two hour movie. Yeah. And you're adding another half hour to it on top of trailers. And yeah. so for the family unit, it, it just wasn't a good call. Like if it was Bugs Bunny or even Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, like the Paul Ruddish cartoons, yeah. I would love a half hour. But like even I'm just like not a smart idea to put in front of a long movie, like or any kid's movie, really. Like it should just be like do a Fandango event or something where it screens nationwide at the same time. There's something else other than that. Like, but yeah. So Secret Life of Pets 2, inoffensive uh, is Eric's word, and I, 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 yeah. I agree with that. And that's – there's not really – is there anything else you want to throw out there about it? I feel like we've uh, just crossed uh, the gamut. There's sadly not a lot to say about it. I know. Yeah. I wish there was more because like, it's, it's, it's just so surface. And it's so – I mean, it's such a um, – I don't know. I'm trying to think of like, the right word to say. But like, it's such a direct story. Yeah. Now, do you feel like this will do you feel like this will continue to dominate the box office because it feels so surface level and sometimes audiences do need surface level things? Well, do you feel like this will continue to be popular because it was number 1 in the box office? No, because it underperformed and Men in Black comes out next week. Okay. Men okay. in Black is going to be, I believe, a much better popcorn film and it's decently family. Mm, yeah. So you might you're gonna pull some from you're gonna pull the older audience away, I think, from uh, Life of Pets too. Okay. I don't think it's gonna have summer legs. I'm yeah. Not, I mean there's decent amount of stuff out there that's okay for kids right now, maybe not the young kids. Mm-hmm. You know, this is still gonna think play okay for the young kids, but I mean, yeah, we got I feel like they're gonna go to Aladdin or Toy Story Four over this. Yeah. I'm not sure when Toy Story 4 comes out in, what, July? Uh, no, it comes out the end of June. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, I don't think this is going to make much money, make enough money before Toy Story 4 just torpedoes it. Yeah. Uh, like said, the our older episode kids. will come out for Toy Story 4 June 28th. So that's, yeah. sorry. That's So, yeah, it's, it's like June 24th is when it comes out, I think. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, because we've got Men in Black next week, which looks solid. Weirdly enough, one of the producers started following me on Instagram. Don't we have? Yeah, well, that's just yeah. That's the weekend before. That's the end of of June, or no? That's next week. That's next week. And then we also have isn't Stuber coming? Spider Man, Stuber, The Lion yeah, King. Stu- Stuber's a bit too old for the kids, though. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I see <laughs> what you're saying. I, I, you're still with on the kids thing. I, yeah, yeah. Just well, think about who's like who's going to go to this, and I think. And then you got Spider Man. So now I have to ask you, and I already know the answer to this, and it makes me sad. But what do you, which of these two films you think has better legs, King of the Monsters or Secret Life of Pets Two? Oh man, I don't. I, I mean, feel I'm, like it's Secret Life of Pets. I, I, I feel like it is just because it's a broader audience. Yeah, and the kids are going to the problem. I mean, so I think I think it's a bad year in general for a lot of sequels. I'm hoping Men in Black changes Breaks that, that. Mm-hmm. but obviously <laughs> x-men did not do well um oh that was the other one that came out and like i have zero interest to watch oh well no one had any interest to watch that is, um, is, is that did you are you going to go see the movie or i mean i'm gonna rent it rent it gotcha i mean my level of apocalypse i mean i'm look, i'm a big comic book fan uh, yeah my, my level of seeing x-men apocalypse was i think i got it free when i got a pizza from marco's <laughs> um, and I feel like there's another pizza in my future, so I'll probably see this one. Fair enough. Fair enough. No, I've got. There's been like nothing about this that movie that made me want to see it. Like Men in Black, it looks really fun to me. Stuber is one that looks fun. Um, mm-hmm. But I, going back to your question about uh, Godzilla, I feel like, and I know this one didn't. This one underperformed a bit. Yeah, not a lot, but a bit. But it also had second week drop off, which I know they were expecting. But I, I feel like the reason the first one did so well mm-hmm. was that a lot of people convinced significant others and whatever to see a Godzilla movie because it had been so long since one had been out. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people this time have been like, well, you can just go to that one alone, honey. Which is sad because, I mean, 
I feel like the monster fights are good enough to surface. I, you know, uh, uh, the human stuff. Mm, but um, well, you know, I like honestly the plot of that. I thought was fine. I thought the the human plot was pretty good. I felt like it just had maybe a little too much focus. I see. I see. Well, cinema. Uh, there's a guy on YouTube called the Angry Video Game Nerd, and he runs a channel called Cinema Cinema Massacre. Okay. And I don't usually watch his stuff that often, but the dude's a legit Godzilla fan. Okay. And he and and he said something that I didn't think about. And he's like, "Why is it?" And I get why movies have this in general, which is when you have a big monster or any monster, you show it in a, in the dark, or you show it in a thunderstorm or whatever. Okay. And he just goes, is it that hard to have fucking any of these monsters out in the day for more than like a 30 second shot? Yeah. Like, like, I just want to see, please, I hope to God, King Kong versus Godzilla or Kong versus Godzilla because now the rights to King Kong. They have rights right, to yeah. Kong, which is ridiculous. Anyway, I, I just hope that there's a fight in the day. And I'm just like, that's a good point. Like, they had more monster fights. So sure, I thought Skull Call uh, kick. <laughs> sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry about that. I'm drinking. Kong <laughs> Skull Island had a decent amount of daytime shots. Oh yeah, totally. I, I, I mean, I feel like I feel like sixty percent of the movie was during the day. Well, he, um, that's, that's the same director that's doing Kong vs. Godzilla, isn't it? Uh, Doherty? Uh, or oh no, oh, no, no, no. Uh, he's. I know who you're talking about. Hold on. Uh, Kong vs. Godzilla. Oh, he almost like died recently because he got into a bar fight in like Taiwan or something. By the way, as I'm saying this right now, there there is now reports that they might shut down production on Godzilla vs Kong due to the low performance. Oh no! Which I oh, hold on, let me. I'm getting, there's that's one says it's shut down. Digital Spy is saying it might be delayed, and I'm like, okay, hold on. Well, folks, this is like. Live, right as it's happening. Uh, Warner Bros. Uh, Toby Emmerich told Deadline that the original release date may be set back in order to release a better movie. It might come out later in the year so we can deliver an A+. Pl- okay, well, then I feel better about that. But uh, I, mean, I, I feel like you're not going to lose any fans by delaying it. Oh, no. Well, so Kong Skull Island took place in the, in the 70s, right? Yeah. Yeah, because... What's his name was? Um, what well, took place? It took. What well, took place right after Vietnam? So I think that. Yeah. So as, right. as everyone was leaving Vietnam. Yeah. Someone said is uh, like old digital spy because you know they got to put clicks and other information and then just what the 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 newsprint said. Corey Hawkins hasn't been confirmed for Godzilla vs Kong. And I'm like, why would he? He was too young to be. You would have to get like a different actor to play him. Okay, I can't read this article anymore. It's pissing me off. Poor reporting. What was I? I, I think yeah, we're talking about Godzilla now, so we we know we have hit the point of <laughs> we have nothing else to add to Secret Life of Pets too. Now, what if in the third one <laughs> they have to smuggle in Godzilla ah! from poachers? Godzilla makes every movie better, so I'm going and to, they have say to sneak yes. him into the apartment building. I would love that. Actually, no, have it be Godzilla's son, Minya. Or Godzuki or whatever, so that way it can actually fit in the building, and then like he can t- he can make himself grow really big and just kill all the animals in the building <laughs> or something ridiculous <laughs> like that. It's like, oh dear, Secret Life of Pets three took a dark turn. I, I was just thinking make an atrium, but whatever. But but you know you know we'll you know what we'll we'll work that out. We'll work that out later yeah. in the uh, in the storyboarding process. Yeah, yeah, we're we're gonna start working on our spec as soon as this podcast is done. Exactly. Uh, well, Eric, thank you so much for doing, uh, as always, any episode oh, that we do for you, CDG. Sir. And uh, to check out Eric's writing, go to ericsternberger.com. And also, in lieu of The Secret Life of Pets, Eric and his wife help out with a great organization called rescuedohio.org. Uh, Rescued Ohio, they help dogs and adoptions and all that stuff. And they, yep. it's such a great cause. Uh, matter of fact, uh, you have like you have like two or three rescues, right? Or... Well, yeah, well, we have two rescues from them. Uh, our last one was a foster fail, which is what they call it when you foster a dog and decide to not give it up. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and we just last weekend broke two out of boarding that we're having to the organization's having to pay to board because we don't have enough foster homes right now, so that they could have just kind of a weekend out of a. Uh, out of boarding and uh, set up a tent in the backyard for him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well, so for more information, go to rescued with a D Ohio.org. Uh, I'll have a link in the show notes. So check that out. And uh, thank you again, Eric. 
Yeah, we're always looking for uh, for new fosters, for people to adopt, or for just donations. So, cool. Hit it up. Get out of here without jeez! You're a creep. Go away. We're having a good time until you start up, cheapers. Uh, go have some coffee with cream or something, because I'll tell you something. This is a happy place.